Hey everybody, this is Johanna speaking. Question, what's the first thing you notice when you walk into a pharmacy? First thing I notice is this massive wall with these small packages and boxes containing pills, powders, and ointments, or perhaps cough syrups and liquids. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that picture? Well, if you have a physical pain, maybe it makes sense for you to use uh, a material drug, meaning pills, ointments, uh, liquids, syrups, or powders, or whatever. But if you have a spiritual illness, say a depression, do you really think you should cure that using a material drug? So that seems to be the problem to me, is that we in our society have grown so extremely accustomed to this belief that all our pains and problems are caused by material issues, and must therefore be healed using a material drug. Now, I'm not here to deny that material drugs work. They obviously do have some kind of effect. If I have a pain in my throat, I know I can take certain painkillers, and the pain does seem to dissipate for a while. But I do want to talk about the fact that there must be, there is a sincere, serious downside to perceiving everything as a chemical imbalance or as a material, physical disorder that can be solved swallowing pills and powders. And I want to dive into this alternative reality where you can heal spiritual pains and perhaps even bodily pains using a spiritual approach. For example, you would heal depression using spiritual methods, and you may even increase your testosterone through spiritual treatment. So how did, I, how did I come up with this topic? Well, I was watching this other video, I will link to it, called Why Testosterone Levels Are Falling. And if you read the, the, the table of contents underneath that video, they will warn you of chemicals such as atrazine. Atrazine is a feminizing chemical that literally can turn men into women, not genetically, but biologically speaking. It turns frogs into female frogs. It doesn't turn them gay. It turns male frogs into female frogs. Not Again, not genetically, but physically, biologically, these frogs are altered into females. Transgenderism. So there's also this other chemical in sunscreen that is called oxybenzone. Uh, so you should not put that on your skin. It is also a feminizing chemical. And so the video goes on to talk about other, like what they call fake estrogens, or what I would call pseudoestrogens. Estrogens are female hormones that will make your body more feminine, even if you are genetically male. So if this is what transgenders do. They swallow the opposite sex's hormones as a hormone treatment program. But these chemicals are also found in plastics and in food, um, for example, if you drink liquids from a plastic bottle, they explain that the plastic, especially at room temperature, it does leak into the liquid. And that means you are swallowing some plastics. And so they also speak of phthalates and parabens and other such chemicals that are just really, really bad for, for men because it lowers all of these chemicals that I mentioned, lower your testosterone. But again, just like my first example about what do you see in a pharmacy, what do you hear in this video? The whole talk is about chemicals, molecules, and so on that somehow diminish your testosterone. I am here to argue not against this. I believe, okay, there is a, there is a material dimension to our reality which involves chemicals, molecules, substances, and so on and so forth. But I am here to argue that masculinity is not a molecule. Right? What makes you a man is spiritual. So what is testosterone all about? Testosterone is also called the action hormone. Women have it as well. In fact, it is also what turns women on. When women feel horny, it's because of their testosterone. The difference is that, an, that a healthy man has about 15 to 20 times as much testosterone in his blood which is what makes men so much more muscular. It's what, it's what makes men more aggressive than women. And it's what gives men this far stronger sexual drive than women have. So if you're a man and you like to have sex twice a day, three times a day, uh, keep in mind that most women you meet will only want it once every 10 days or so. 
So that's that's why it's so hard for men to get laid with women because most women don't need it as often as men do. They don't need orgasms as often. But if masculinity, as I say, is not a molecule, then what is it? Why do men have testosterone at all? What does testosterone really do? What does it do in wild animals, for example? So uh, I believe uh, Dr. Huberman, or Huberman, Huberman, <laughs> on the Joe Rogan podcast show, he explains that in the wild, wild, most males never get to mate with a female because of the extreme physical competition between males to win access over females. Among a certain kind of group of horses, for example, there's the alpha male who mates with all the females, and the beta males stay behind. They stay away. They are literally kept away from the women who are not allowed to mate until one of the beta males feels that he's ready to confront the alpha, to, to try to oust the alpha and replace him and become the new alpha. Until then, the alpha rules over the females and the females show no willingness at all to sleep with the beta males. They will only want to sleep with the alpha male who is the biggest, strongest, but also the least afraid. And that's what this video is going to be about. Testosterone is the hormone or the chemical that gives men the mental strength, the psychological ability to face pain, torture, and death, or risk pain, risk torture, and risk actual death. To overcome the fear of these things is what defines masculinity. You won't hear that from Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson tells you to refine yourself, to clean your room, and to dress up, to dress nicely like a gentleman, and that is beta male culture. Alpha male is what distinguishes the alpha male from the beta males, and for example, the example of the horses. It, the, the thing that defines the alpha male is he has proven to the females that he is least afraid of pain, torture, and death. Meaning the alpha male will be the first male to put himself in harm's way. If there were predators like wolves or lions or bears chasing the female horses, the alpha male is the one who will put himself in harm's way. So there is a price to be paid. An alpha male pays the price for being allowed to sleep with the females. He is least afraid of predators. And mind you, all horses are animals of prey. The so-called alpha horse is still an animal of prey and is still very afraid of predators. But the, the horse male who is least afraid of danger is the alpha. The same for the females. The female least afraid of predators, the female horse least afraid of predators is the alpha female. That's how it works. Those beings among mammals who overcome their fear of pain, torture, and death, which is what happens when you confront an animal, a predator animal, those ones are in charge of the herd, which makes perfect sense, right? Along, among animals, the least afraid are the leaders. So different is it now among human beings, isn't it? Our politicians often seem to be the most afraid, the most fearful people who want to, you know, lock us down in curfews and whatever to, you know, secure society. So try to appreciate this strange fact that among human beings, we are no longer being ruled by alphas. We are being ruled by the beta males and the beta females. Mind you, behind every beta male is a beta female. They are the ones most afraid of danger, of societal collapse, of the right-wing man. Where do you think this anti-white male thing comes from? The white men of Northwest European descent are still physically the biggest men. On average, they are the tallest, and on average, they are still the biggest men with the most muscle, on average. Now, the West Central Africans that you find in the United States, for example, they are also big and tall on average, and they also have lots of testosterone. The thing is here that if being a man is really about your psychological willingness to face pain, torture, and death, then in this sense, Christ, you know, Jesus Christ of Christianity, is a is an example, is a perfect example of manliness. Christ, even though, even though he was a meek figure, or at least he's described as being a meek figure, Christ is the embodiment of overcoming the fear of pain, torture, and death. He is tortured by the Romans, and then he dies, <clears throat> but he knew these things were coming, and he was not afraid. He, was, he continued his teachings to his peoples, to his followers, knowing full well that one day he would be betrayed, and then he would face pain, torture, and death. And it is because Christ overcomes the fear of these things that he later also resurrects. So he, he not only overcomes the fear of death, he then also overcomes death itself. 
Which, truthfully speaking, whether you're religious or not, this is a fantastic story that you should tell people about. To overcome the fear of pain, torture, and death, and then to overcome death itself. <clears throat> but if, if true masculinity, then, can exist in the form of a Christ figure who is generally meek in his, in his manners, he's not the physically strongest man, so to speak. He's not the most aggressive man. But he is a man who faces pain, torture, and death, and he's not afraid of it. That does make a man the alpha. In humans, men with high testosterone can be athletes, boxers, kickboxers. Any man willing to put himself in harm's way is showing that he is masculine. Uh, also through work. If you are a worker dealing with, I don't know, heavy equipment, heavy, heavy loads, um, whatever you're doing that may lead to physical injury and you're not afraid of it, that's masculinity. If you're one of those guys who climbs up a radio tower to replace lights up there, and this is a very dangerous job, and you know one in so many men falls down and hurts themselves or dies, that is also evidence of you being very masculine. Masculine men have high testosterone, but they also have to have that psychology of being willing to put themselves in harm's way, to face pain, torture, and death. So this is why I think it's a bit awkward. If you want to be a strong man, physically strong, with big muscle, and you start injecting yourself with testosterone, you have testosterone injections to build muscle, but you're not willing to face pain, torture, and death, then you're not masculine. You have a lot of testosterone, but you're unmanly. So where does, where does in all this talk, where does the spiritual dimension really uh, introduce itself? It is so that I believe that in order to become manlier, you don't need to inject yourself with testosterone hormone. I believe that there is a spiritual activity where you push yourself through your own free will. You commandeer yourself to go out there and to act. Even going for a walk is better than not doing anything at all. You go to the boxing ring to train boxing. You go to the gym to do the effort of building muscle but you do it without cheating, you do it without testosterone supplements, without steroids. I believe that if that men who compel themselves to act will end up having higher levels of testosterone, <clears throat> whereas men who are not motivated to live at all are the ones who will end up having very low levels of testosterone. So I don't believe that masculinity is a molecule and that you can solve your lack of what? Lack of manliness, lack of muscle by simply injecting yourself with male hormone. That, I believe, can only be a temporary solution. It may work for a while. It may give you some more energy, some more aggression. But if you're not using this aggression to face pain, torture, and death, then you're still not really a man. I mean, it would be very wrong for transgenders, for, say, people born as biological females, they think that all they have to do is take the testosterone shots, have their breasts and wombs amputated, and then grow some muscle and grow a beard, and now you're a man? No, you're only a man if you are also willing to put yourself in harm's way for society. So soldiers, for example, behave in a manly way, and female soldiers who put themselves in harm's way also be behave in a masculine way. A man who shuns battle is unmanly. A man who runs away when danger arrives is unmanly. Manliness is not a molecule. Manliness is a mindset. 